Okay, so hello and welcome everybody to this webinar on converting workshops to online training organized by the Space EU and Scientix project. My name is Bjorn Bachmann and I'm coordinating European Schoolnet's activities in the Space EU project. More precisely, I'm working on educators continuing professional development. I will be the moderator for today's webinar in collaboration with Agata Gras, head of the Science Education Department at European Schoolnet. Together with us today in the room, we have Tomasz Juskiv, who will be supporting this webinar from a technical point of view. So if you have any questions, any issues uh, with your audio or connection, please do not hesitate to send him a chat uh, message in the private chat, which you will find in the bottom right corner of the webinar window. And of course, most importantly, I'm very pleased to welcome today's speakers who will share their best practices on how to convert online training, I'm sorry, how to convert workshops to online training. So thank you very much for being here. This webinar, as you can take from the title, will address how to convert workshops to online training. And before we move on, let me just be clear on the vocabulary we're using here. We all are organizing online meetings and webinars, especially in these challenging times that we're currently experiencing. These online meetings and webinars are often transmissive, meaning that they include speakers and listeners and that the speakers take up most of the time. Uh, when we're talking about workshops, however, we're talking about interactive and usually hands-on sessions where the participants learn about something, including also by means of transmissive communication, of course, but most importantly, by taking an active role. Uh, this can be done by testing or practicing or implementing actual activities. So while in webinars, participants are active only to a smaller extent, in workshops, their active participation should make up the majority of the session. Let's come back to the title of this webinar. We're addressing today how to convert face-to-face -face workshops to interactive online training. The guiding question for today will therefore be how to translate these hands-on and interactive workshop sessions into online settings. And how do we keep these interactive and hands-on aspects in online settings? To answer this question, we will uh, start with an overview of uh, some experiences we've had at European Schoolnet in the STEAMIT project before we then invite our guest speakers to share their best practices. At the end, we will have time for your questions to the speakers, so please share your questions, comments, suggestions in the chat. Again, you will find the chat in the bottom right corner of the webinar window, and we will be checking the chat to collect your questions and address them in the end. We will also share a feedback survey at the end of this webinar. And in this feedback forum, you will be able to request a certificate of attendance to this webinar. All right, let's start with the experience we had here at European Schoolnet in the STEAMIT project, where we converted a one and a half day face-to-face -face workshop to a one day online training. For this, Agata will be sharing five key lessons learned and with this, I'm passing on the mic to my colleague, Agata. Good morning. So at the end of February, we had to convert a 1.5 day workshop in the future classroom lab at, in Brussels to an online event. And we actually had two days to do it. Now, this was not a webinar like today's, which is mostly transmissive, but a hands-on training with discussions and many different sessions where participants had to leave the, the workshop with clear tasks and knowledge from what, of what they had to do next. From this experience, we found five tips that we want to share with you. And uh, honestly, we're learning as we go, and we even had more lessons that we've learned in the last few weeks. You're all organizing online events, so we're all having to go through these at different times. Now, the very first 
tip goes not only for training online, but any type of event. But it's particularly important in a training because it's going to be a longer time, longer hours. So first of all, which tool are you going to use? There's many in the market. There's many different options. And all of them have different things that work, things that work well, things that are different features. The important thing is, first of all, that you choose a tool that is easy for the user and does not frustrate them. Because if it becomes about frustration, then it's not about the content, it's just about the technology. And something we learned a couple of weeks ago when we tried to organize this webinar the first time, you always have to have a plan B. And the plan B is not only about uh, knowing that you have a second tool, but being ready with it knowing that uh, you might have to change at the last minute. In fact, uh, I will also add that you should be aware when you're already live so you don't end up commenting on things live as we were told we were doing two weeks ago. And we're just very happy we didn't say anything inappropriate. Now, the second tip I want to share is very important, especially for long term online events, in particular training. And it's that you have to have a very clear schedule and you have to respect it. Now, this is always important in live events, but it's very important in online events because you don't have the flexibility of saying, well, we'll just take a break now because you don't know what their situation is at home. So you need to make sure that whenever the coffee breaks or the short breaks are scheduled, that's when they take place. Whenever the next session starts, that's when you should start doing it. It's very important to stick to that schedule and make it very, very clear. The next tip we want to share is that if you're doing an online training, this is all about how to do hands on things as well. So you can schedule offline sessions as well. So even though it's an online event, online training, there's specific times when you're going to actually disconnect so the participants can do some hands on work and then come back online at the specified time. The fourth tip is that there's a number of tools that allow virtual breakout rooms. So now we're all we have 230 participants in this room. If we wanted to do parallel sessions, we would use a tool that allows to break up into different pieces in the, into different rooms. You cannot see me, but I'm actually doing hands gestures as well. And then in those rooms, you can have smaller discussions, smaller workshops, and then come back to the one room where you have the plenary. And the final tip is that you should have support person. So, for example, we have Thomas there in the background that is helping out uh, some different colleagues that might have issues with audio or with the screen. So the main presenter can concentrate on actually discussing. Be prepared for the unforeseen and be flexible. Things happen, technology fails, uh, internet has issues or anything can happen. And be, be aware that, well, we're all in this together and slowly and steadily we can make everything work well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Agadam. And uh, thanks for this very nice introduction to the whole topic and the first insights. We now have the pleasure to welcome our five expert speakers, each from a very diverse background in the education field. And here we have Ana Noronha, the executive director at Ciencia Viva in Portugal, Angelos Latsuris from Elino Germanica Agogi in Greece, Brandon Owens from the Science Gallery Dublin in Ireland, Dimitrios Tziat Studis from GFOS Open Technologies Alliance in Greece, and Ivo Jokin from the Municipal Center for Extracurricular Activities in Baikal Village, Bulgaria. Each speaker will have an absolute maximum of five or ten minutes to present, depending on what we previously agreed with them, and to share their best practices. I have to say that we will be very strict with the time, so please be aware that we might have to mute them if they go on longer than agreed. And 
Again, if you have any questions, please feel free to share them in the chat window and we will address them later to the speakers in the Q&A session. Now, without further ado, I will leave the floor to Anna Moronia, who will share her best Thank practices. Thank you. So, good morning, everybody. Uh, I just um, wanted to share Anna, some if, brief thoughts ah, about uh, uh, what is so similar and what is different in online and face-to-face -face training, and particularly Oh, I thought it was on. I'm sorry. Okay, is to that interrupt. okay? Do you okay. want to turn on so, your uh, webcam? So, so I just uh, wanted to share uh, with you uh, what uh, some thoughts about what is uh, uh, what we feel is, are the best, uh, the, the largest differences between face to face and online, and particularly in this situation that we are. Um, that you are leaving now about this uh, lockdown due to COVID. Uh, so, could you please pass my first slide? Okay, thank you. So, uh, in the traditional face-to-face, -face, we are very aware of the demography we want to reach, and we search for it, we adapt for it, uh, in terms of level of content and language and the tone of communication, we do not, well, every one of us knows this. We also know that uh, uh, we, who, who is our audience, and we can monitor the audience eye to eye uh, constantly, so we can see if the audience is understanding, if they are enjoying, if they are uh, not enjoying and looking to their mobile phones, etc. So we can monitor their reaction. And also, and this is a very, uh, very important question regarding particularly space U, uh, we can address underrepresented or underprivileged groups. We know that when we uh, invite, make the dissemination of some event, uh, we know that there are some groups that it is difficult to reach out. So we also know that we have to work with uh, with associations, public authorities, we have to do something towards them, like, for example, supporting the travel uh, to address these communities. This is easier to do in traditional face-to-face -face than in uh, um, than in a webinar or an online activity. Now, we also have the, the online in usual times what do we do? We have to create activities for the demography we want to address. Uh, so it is not easy uh, to adapt simply face-to-face -face activities to online. We have to take into consideration that this is a different way of communicating. Uh, and a very uh, important aspect is that we do not have an audience. Right now, we have people listening. But you are not talking to each other. Maybe there is some activity in the chat, but there is not eye-to-eye -eye activity or comments or uh, reactions within the, the listeners. So the listeners, each listener is an individual listener. So it is different from an audience when we are in a room. And uh, uh, again, uh, we have that main difference with face-to-face -face activities is uh, also that web activities are not so inclusive because, uh, well, uh, uh, we know that many people still don't have access to internet. Uh, I put here a survey today because it was supposed to be uh, in the first date this was scheduled. But it is pretty recent that uh, even in Lisbon, which is the country's best um, uh, region for connections, not all uh, children are connected or have computers at home. So these are difficulties that we have to bear in mind. Just to, to, to end, what can we do now with COVID? So COVID puts an additional stress, an additional difference into online. So it is different to be online from face to face, and it is different to be online with COVID. Uh, because uh, families are locked down at home, 
So uh, it is more difficult to target the specific audience. So what we have been doing, and also people are very stressed. They are doing a lot of course uh, at the same time, like uh, learning at home, working from home. So there is teleschool, telework, uh, all these going on at the same time. So what we thought was give them something that they need, give them something that is relevant for them. And so, for example, we came up with this uh, Ciencia Viva en Casa, meaning lively science at home, uh, which are uh, offers of activities, uh, short videos, quizzes, things that you can do at home in family and whenever, whenever you want. Um, so uh, another important thing is social media. Social media, you can engage uh, people at home. I'm sorry, I'm having some noise, but I'm just finishing. You can have people at home engaged in an asynchronous way. Uh, so you can use and you can monitor, uh, you can address different uh, demographies by using different social networks. For example, the social networks that you use, for example, in Facebook will be different from the social networks you use in Instagram or in other social networks that you know are specifically used by children. So you can control a bit the audience you are addressing by using the suitable, uh, the suitable networks. And uh, the advantage of social networks is that they can be addressed asynchronously. So whenever the family has a break, whenever the child has a break from teleschool, they can go into their favorite social networks and engage with you and be engaged with you. So I think this is all that I wanted to to, to share with you, uh, the Ciencia Viva in Casa has been a success. There are lots of hits, lots of people using them. And um, and so I thought this experience might be relevant for this. All for right. This. Thank you so much. And thanks for your presentation. I think it was very interesting. And we will now move on to uh, Angelos. Uh, Angelos Ladzuris from Ilino Germaniki Agogi. Uh, please enable also your webcam so we can see you and your microphone. Okay. I think we can hear you already. Okay. Thank you. Perfect. So, thank you. Angelus, the floor uh, is yours. Good morning. In the middle of this uh, pandemic, I just hope you and your loved ones are healthy and uh, safe. My very short presentation here is about. Uh, workshops for uh, that uh, are about uh, teachers and uh, are transferred from hands-on to on, uh, online. Um, can we move to the second slide, please? Oh, sorry. Okay. Okay. So uh, I have uh, distinguished the, the trainings in uh, two categories, two broad categories. The one are, they're both online. Some of them can be also offline. But the main difference between them is, are, is the following. The first category that you see here requires doing an online activity, a live activity, like visiting a site or taking action, collecting real data, and analyzing it. Not in real time, but, but the collection of data could be in real time. In order to do such uh, uh, training, you must have uh, some preparation, and this depends on the data you will have to be collected. I will give you uh, examples. And then you can have the presentation and visit with the other participants the online uh, website and uh, collect your data. Such an example is, for example, uh, using uh, robotic telescopes in a classroom or requesting data files uh, from uh, researchers and their research uh, institutions. I will, I will talk about uh, both. So uh, for the robotic uh, telescopes, you can select a telescope and uh, sign for some time, get some time for observation, and then together with the participants, uh, follow the instructions and uh, log in and uh, 
use the robotic telescope to, uh, for example, select uh, an uh, image. The good thing with uh, some of these telescopes is, uh, especially for teachers that want to do this in, in the classroom, that the time difference uh, helps us a lot. So you can select a telescope, for example, in Hawaii and uh, do this um, demonstration and uh, in uh, the classroom in uh, the morning due to the difference uh, of uh, time. So this is uh, one category where you uh, have to uh, pre-organize uh, and uh, ask for time to use uh, the telescope so you can do it with uh, participants. There is another category where you can, uh, instead of having a live uh, observation, you can request uh, some uh, data. This uh, sometimes has to be done also ahead of time before you do the workshop with uh, the participants. For example, if you want to do a um, scenario, an educational scenario, scenario about the craters on of the moon, uh, you can uh, go, for example, at observing with NASA website and uh, request an image uh, of the moon. You can do this 48 hours before, and you just send an email and say, I would like uh, an image of the moon uh, today, or, and then you will receive it within two days uh, in your uh, email. And so this is one other type of uh, activities uh, that you can uh, uh, do. Uh, of course, you can also uh, select uh, a series of images either beforehand, so you can select them and store them and uh, do the activity in the classroom. For example, if you want to study the rotation of the sun and you need pictures of the sun, that, so you have to, so you can uh, observe and you can uh, measure the, how the sunspot moves, and so you can in this case you can ask for pictures for five consecutive days of the sun and use them in uh, your uh, workshop. So this is one thing. Another another type of activities that you can do online is um, going to some websites and uh, collecting uh, some uh, parameters. For example. There is the Eratosthenes experiment where you want to measure with your students the circumference of the Earth. In order to do so, you need to know, for example, the location, your location. So you can go in, in our workshop, we go with the teachers on um, a specific website like MapMaker. They can find the coordinates of their school. They can also find the distance of their school through from, for example, the um, Ecuador, if we're talking about uh, the Equinox Day, uh, they can also go in some other softwares, some other uh, websites and locate uh, the total noon, which is basically when they will have to take their uh, measurement. Uh, in these type of activities, you can either, as Agida said, you can either stop and then go out and uh, make your measurement and come back and uh, perform the analysis, or you can give all the information, explain to the teachers the process, how they have to do it, and just uh, select some existing data, some old data, and do the analysis with them step by step to show them what they have to go uh, through with uh, their students. And then you stop it there, the teachers go and they perform the activity with their students, they collect the data, they analyze it with the data that they collect during uh, their uh, during the day that they select to do uh, the experiment. So these are the live. There are also now the online uh, activities that uh, you require you to visit, for example, um, archives or offline. This requires opening an app, downloadable on your computer, uh, taking uh, some action with uh, the app or so on. Uh, in this category, we have also many games or simulations, like uh, the FED simulations fall in this uh, category. So uh, here, in terms of preparation, you have to send, if it's a small uh, app, you have to send uh, the app to the uh, teachers. You have to ensure them that the app is safe for them to be downloadable on the, their uh, computer. And uh, you can let them play with it like a few days or one or two days before the, the event, uh, before you do the actual uh, activity with uh, the uh, simulation. So if it's not a downloadable app, it can be a link. And uh, 
that uh, you can send or some uh, videos. So during the training, you have you show them how the app works, even though they have practiced with it a, a little bit. You guide them through the analysis of, uh, and uh, you can run the application, collect data, do the simulation and, and so on. Um, some activities that uh, fall in this uh, category, for example, is if you uh, want to do an activity of uh, colliding uh, galaxies. You can use a simulator and uh, you can show them um, how they can uh, do it. Another activity is if you want to send, for example, you want to see when is it the right time for someone to send a, a spaceship from Earth uh, to Mars. So there are these simulators you see on the left screen that uh, show the rotation of the Earth and the Mars around the Sun. And you have to play this game and see when is the, the right time to launch uh, your uh, rocket. Of course, you can also do a combination besides you, between the first case and the second. For example, you can use robotics telescopes to uh, capture an image of colliding galaxies, and then you can go into an offline uh, activity where you can uh, simulate these uh, crashing galaxies. There are also some here, you see also, I just put there one up, maybe you know this app, the scale of the universe, you can also have this uh, uh, type uh, of uh, apps, uh, as I said uh, before. So just to close to conclude, I would like to say, and as uh, Agueda said and talked earlier about virtual breakout rooms, you also have the opportunity, if you use the right tool and if you have access to the right uh, uh, tool, to do collaborative uh, workshops, like workshops where you can divide the, the whole group into subgroups and let the, the teachers, uh, for example, uh, run uh, the workshop as a team and uh, present their outcome also uh, as a team. An example of this is uh, something that we do like uh, storytelling about a trip uh, to Mars. This is uh, when the teachers uh, form a, a team. And at the end of the workshop, they uh, develop their, their own short story with the characters following all the steps of storytelling. And uh, they present it uh, as uh, a team. So to conclude, uh, in space EU, we, uh, we had last year a very successful summer school. We, were we, will, we will not have this summer school this year. But in order for us to practice what we preach, we will try to do some workshops and you will be informed by UN and we will run these workshops in July and they're gonna be open and uh, online for you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, thanks for these very... Yes, it was perfect. You were just in time. <laughs> thanks. So, and this I think was a very um, nice example of hands-on online uh, solutions that can be used uh, by anyone. So thanks for your presentation. And uh, for everyone joining us today, please don't be shy and share your questions in the chat so we can address your questions and comments or suggestions to our speakers in the end. Now we will move on to our next speaker, uh, Brandon Owens from the Science Gallery in Dublin. So, Brandon, uh, I see your microphone is already enabled. If you want to enable your webcam, now would be the moment. Perfect. So, we can see you. And then I leave the floor to you. You have five minutes. Okay. Thank you, Bjorn. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd like to also say, as well as Andalus, that uh, I hope everybody is safe and well in these trying times. Um, I arrived into my job at Science Gallery Dublin uh, for about one and a half weeks of being in the physical building before coming home uh, to work from home. So it's been a very interesting time. And the interactions I'm about to tell you about are a slightly different context. So I first of all wanted to introduce that. Um, rather than um, an educational workshop, the context for the experience I have had is around training uh, partners for an EU project. Uh, so people like yourselves who are trying to run projects uh, to, and the, uh, the goal of what we ran was to replace an on-site workshop with an online workshop. 
Um, but it wasn't just a webinar. It was meant to have a lot of interactive activity uh, and uh, consisted of 21 participants across nine partner countries uh, with Science Gallery hosting in the virtual world as opposed to the physical. And um, we had lots of time zone variations. So uh, Agata at the very top said timings are very important. Where you place your training, depending on how far the scope is, is very, very important. Uh, so we had time zone variations of GMT plus one, plus two, and plus three. Um, and just to give a little idea of what we were intending to cover uh, for that online uh, activity and online training, uh, we definitely wanted to include an icebreaker, which is much easier if you can do it physically in a, in a room, but we wanted to emulate that in the virtual space. So you see a picture here of a, a famous park in Dublin, Phoenix Park. And uh, we, we just asked a simple question, what animal did you wake up as this morning? So something fun and lighthearted, and I think it's very important to keep that in uh, your training or in your workshops and uh, to be able to keep the momentum going and keep the atmosphere uh, light as possible. Uh, and I'll come back to what tool we use to do that in a moment. Uh, we wanted to get some feedback on a, a draft survey, so a document we wanted to send out. So we wanted to get some level of feedback. Uh, we wanted to use some different stakeholder tools training, so using maps that would have been used with stickies. So what I'm about to tell you, and this included, is something that's applicable to any time you want to uh, add stickies to something, make uh, ideas, decide directions, that sort of thing. Uh, we wanted to review the training format and the duration, and the most important thing is we wanted to be low on presentation and high on interaction. So the tools and the preparation that we had. Uh, tools, first of all, we used um, Mural, which is a shared whiteboard space with many different templates that you can bring in and build a very big whiteboard space to collaborate in. Uh, we used Zoom as our video conferencing software, uh, and that had the breakout rooms feature, which had to be carefully managed. A very important point is to make sure you have enough people facilitating your workshop online that you're not loading one person with the responsibility of looking after everything, of hosting and tech support and looking after breakout rooms. And finally, we have Mentimeter, which is a surveying tool, very easy to vote from your phone. So to be able to make decisions as part of workshops, that was very important. Uh, for the preparation uh, for Zoom, I think the best thing is for people to practice e etiquette. So we can uh, check that we're using headphones, we don't get the feedback loops and strange noises, and uh, using the chat function and learning to mute and unmute, some basic skills that people should learn before they participate. So it might be a short email explaining people to test these things. And Mural is a shared whiteboard space, uh, and we issued a small pre-work task, something people could work on themselves without support with some level of instruction and a simple task to get used to that too. And Mentimeter uh, was prepared prior to the workshop. So the surveys were ready to go and included as part of the shared whiteboard space. So people could go on their phone, enter a simple code and take part in a survey. Those tools all have a, a free element and a priced element, but there are totally free alternatives available. And this looks a little insane for people who are seeing the screen. Uh, this is an example of a completed mural after the workshop. Um, but the important thing about the shared white space is that you zoom into one small area and you work through it one step at a time. But the most important tool that we have is that it allows you to uh, double click and add stickies anywhere, just like you would have post-it notes in real life. And that can be applicable so, for so many different situations. So very, very useful to use. And this is what it looks like when it's complete. It can be exported as a, a PDF. It can be uh, segmented into different uh, images, uh, lots of different things. And also very importantly, it has a sidebar as part of the mural that is a set of instructions for people to follow like chapters going through the workshop step by step. So you can rely on that. Uh, on the day, just to say communication is very important. Uh, there's familiar traps of video conferencing. I would very much recommend that you focus on either task or talk. Don't try to do both at the same time. Decision making is best done with Mentimeter in our experience. Using breakout rooms from Zoom was very, very uh, good, but you need that extra facilitation and using some level of pre-work is the right idea, preparing. So I'd like to end just by saying that we evaluated our sessions. So just to leave you with a little insight into how that went, if you can see this on your screen of how helpful we found the workshop, how easy it was to use Mural, uh, how easy it was to use Zoom, and how we'd rate the length of the workshop. I think it's very important to gather your feedback. 
to be able to improve on your uh, experience for next time. Thank you. Thank you a lot. And definitely, I totally agree with you regarding the feedback, which is also why today in this webinar we will send out at the end a feedback form in which the participants are very welcome to share their feedback and comments for today. And thanks, Brandon, for all these tools. Very helpful to structure an online uh, training session, an interactive workshop. I think these are very uh, useful tools that you've presented there. So we will move on now to Dimitrios uh, from Greece, the GFAS Open Technologies Alliance. So Dimitris, and your webcam is on. So perfect, you have 10 minutes from now. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I am Dimitris Diastoudis from Thessaloniki, Greece. I'm a PhD, PhD candidate uh, researching didactics of physics and also a science teacher in secondary education in school for deaf and hard of hearing students. I'm here today uh, to present you one of the greatest uh, plugin activities for Moodle, uh, the workshop activity. Uh, this presentation uh, cannot be a tutorial on workshop because of time limitations and consider it as just a banner shouting that if you want to convert a workshop in an online activity, you must search for the workshop plugin for Moodle. And I will show you where and why to do this. Uh, Moodle is an online course management system, and that's something that either you are familiar with the term or it doesn't mean anything to you. But I think that nowadays we all discover that there's a bunch of software for teachers out there starting from teleconference applications uh, like Adobe Connect, Skype, or Zoom, to entire uh, educational platforms such as Moodle. Uh, on the other hand, we are struggling with absence of engagement and personality characteristics uh, to the online experience. And um, why to use Moodle for that? Well, uh, one of the reasons I'm using Moodle is that uh, it is a learning platform that embodies a social constructivist pedagogical framework. It's full of social interactions such as uh, forums, uh, wikis, uh, but also modules for expressing personality such as blogs. And uh, although it is uh, 20 years old, it is more than flexible and of course it's open source. Well, Open source is not just a tool category. We believe in GeForce that it is a culture that we have the opportunity to teach uh, when we use it. And uh, if you have never used it as a teacher before, imagine it uh, as a platform that comes with a great uh, set of bricks, but you can also uh, use thousands of other bricks that Open Community builds. And uh, the only thing you have to do is to plug in those bricks to foundations uh, that are called uh, courses. And there are uh, four different categories of bricks which represent the different actions we can enable. Uh, those are storing, communication, collaboration, and evaluation. Well, as you can see, um, there are uh, too many ways to accomplish those actions according to our needs and aims of our courses. I'm here today um, to present you one of these modules, uh, the workshop activity. Well, uh, workshop uh, is one of the main modules that come with the core module. And so the only thing you have to do is to decide to add uh, this activity in, in your course. When you do that, you will see there are four separate phases. At first, there is a setup phase. In this phase, we add the name and description of our workshop. We can choose between four grading methods. Uh, the submission format, uh, whether it's going to be a file or a text or perhaps a link. Uh, we can set assessment inputs and feedback for submission and dates for the separate phases. Uh, the second uh, period, is the submission phase, where every participant following instructions, uh, taking part in activities, and submit his work. 
Um, in this phase, the teacher can choose the method of allocation for the peer review assessment that follows after this phase. Um, in the next phase, the assessment phase, it's a great phase uh, for the teachers since students are doing the work and teachers simply monitor the process. Of course, uh, we set the assessment criteria, which has to be clear to the students, uh, perhaps a rubric with this review. And uh, at last, we have the grading evaluation phase, uh, in which we can check over generous or unkind students' grade. We can also publish selected submissions uh, as good or poor examples. In this phase, a student uh, has to be patient since it could last some days according to the number of the participants we have. And uh, I think uh, that was uh, the workshop model on Moodle, which, as uh, I said, it's uh, 20 years old, but it has the ability to change and adapt. One of these adaptations is the mobile, mobile app you can use to have a hands-on control of the course and the messages you will receive. And keeping the above in mind, um, I think that Moodle, along with the mobile app, is a great tool for making an online workshop, which not only can be equal to a face-to-face -face procedure, but it can also be better because of the valuable analytics that we can have. Uh, I have used this module in a lot of cases, such as the Cinema Club in Aristotle University, where it is an online club, uh, as also in projects such as Space EU, where we have um, uh, the Cinema Space Flick uh, uh, course, where we have um, 18 teachers, uh, and we have workshops on this. Uh, as for hands-on experiences, uh, we have uh, a course, I coordinate a course in e-twinning seminars uh, using uh, simulators for Arduino, where we had uh, 400 participants separated in groups, of course. And uh, for our research team in Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, uh, we have 3D, 3D printing courses with more than 300 participants. And uh, this module uh, work, uh, works great. Um, thank you. That's all I have to say for you. Don't hesitate to contact me with any further or any further information. Thank you a lot uh, for thank your you. presentation. And uh, this very useful tool, Moodle. I think uh, it can be used very easily and very efficiently in a class and for online training. So uh, we will now move on to our last speaker of today before we then turn to the question and answer session. So again, if you have any questions to our previous speakers or to the next speaker, share them in the chat and we will address them in the end. So Ivo, now it is time for you to enable your microphone. And if you have a webcam, then you can also turn it on, but um, I believe there were some difficulties, so if not, let's keep it like this. Uh, can you hear as well, and can you speak? Hello, everybody. Uh, I, uh, okay, we can hear you. Uh, yeah, you can hear me? We can hear you well. Um, so uh, I'm a science teacher, astronomy, physics, uh, biology, um, and the director of Municipal Center for Extracurricular Activities in Bulgaria. Uh, I would like to share my uh, uh, experience uh, from my opinion in uh, activities in Municipal Center for Extracurricular Activities. Next slide, please. So, uh, from my experience, technical requirements. Prepare online meeting uh, as it, uh, it were going uh, uh, live. Good internet platform across and settings, school, work, how will uh, access uh, be, uh, and also send uh, pre prepared materials. 
This is lean homework uh, materials. I will explain uh, in the next slide, please. Yeah, next slide. And uh, this is uh, two part of the online uh, meeting. Uh, for example, this is a pedagogical approach. Duration not existing 15, 60 minutes. Be interactive with uh, participants. This is maybe will be uh, teachers or students. After the theoretical part, this is about 20 minutes, provide brief guideline for uh, the practical part. For example, this is, will be maybe the model uh, of uh, Equatorial Sundale. I will show you this uh, model for the Equatorial Sundial. Yeah, for paper. Yeah, this is um, very cheap materials from uh, every uh, kitchen or home. Also, maybe to, to prepare a moving star map from a Kepler mission. Uh, we need only glue, uh, knife, and uh, paper. Um, also, uh, maybe uh, uh, we encourage students and teachers to use uh, online uh, or uh, smartphone. For example, how to turn student smartphone or teachers to make a simple quadrant. We need only elastic and uh, straw for uh, juice and uh, application, uh, mobile application uh, uh, on protractor and encourage uh, teachers with their students to uh, make a real inquiry, a real uh, measurement of, the, for example, for uh, latitude of the stars or uh, four stars. This is very, very important uh, star. After that, um, we have discussion, working with the finished model, explain uh, participants, uh, teachers, how to uh, use them, uh, how to working uh, with uh, them. This is maybe will be about uh, 10 minutes. And uh, after that, uh, for the finish uh, question and feedback, uh, this is about uh, uh, five uh, minutes. If you are in a science um, hall or cabinet in your school, now you can use uh, a telescope or uh, simple devices uh, to, to, ex uh, to show them uh, in real time uh, experience. This is for me, for my experience, is very, very important that uh, participants, teachers, not only see it in front of the, the monitor, uh, but actively uh, involved them in uh, real time, real world uh, uh, experience. Also, um, of course, we have uh, many, many uh, online tools, especially in uh, uh, SpaceU website. Uh, there is uh, very, very rich and very, very good um, tools um, uh, like uh, Star in a Box. Uh, also, you can use with the participants and show them uh, citizen science. Of course, this is very, very important. In real time, you can uh, show them, uh, for example, augmented reality with, uh, for example, this is from um, Planetary Institute, how to explore moon with uh, your telephone, with mobile telephone. I try to, to show you how it's uh, working. And you see, yeah, you can see the moon, of course, yeah, you can see the moon. And with students, this is very, very fun for, uh, for teachers. Um, also, uh, you can use um, ready, uh, ready materials, for example, this is pizza box and how to to show students with disability, for example, with eye disability. This is very, very simple and very easy to, to prepare model. Uh, our uh, Earth, this is tactile model for uh, students with uh, eye disability. And also, it's a box spectroscope. You can use this uh, piece from uh, old CD. 
Thank you for your attention. And thank you, Ivo, for your presentation. Now, I just want to mention we will uh, share the recording and the slides of this webinar uh, with you and everyone in the follow-up email and on the respective projects websites on Scientix and Space EU. So if you had experience over the course of the webinar seeing the slides or hearing, seeing the videos, anything, then you might want to check out the recordings that we will make available in the following days. Now, at this point, we will turn to the question and answer session, and I will uh, hand over the microphone to my colleague Agada, who will moderate this part. Thank you, Bjorn. So our first question is for Anna, where they are saying that uh, their web activities are not exclusive, according to what you mentioned. Can you share an example of activities that can be done online instead? Sorry, activities that can be done online. Well, uh, for example, teacher training, there you know your audience, you know what are the teachers that you are addressing. So that can be done online. Um, we, we are also planning to do some activities for families, uh, where you warn it is for families, and then you do uh, simple things with hands-on with uh, some time for people to go and get the necessary uh, materials. Uh, so this is what the, the greatest difficulty is for people who might not have internet, there you can not do anything. Thank you very much, Anna. We also have a question from Angelos. Uh, they were asking, how do you assess the success of online training? That's actually very important. Of course, assessing an online training, there's two aspects. One is, are you assessing the participants or the success of the event? Do you have a tips on that? Yes. You should... No, I, I don't have. Oh, okay. Yes? Sorry. Yes. Uh, usually we do that uh, through uh, interviews. If we're talking about a training activity, as it used to be, not an online. It used to be like a summer school. But uh, for, through an online, it has it is either uh, through uh, uh, an interview or a questionnaires. Uh, or it can be also in, in, a, in a later stage uh, through questionnaires that have been given to the students of the teachers that have uh, practiced or implemented uh, this uh, activity. And this can be either uh, questionnaires that have to do about uh, if they like the activity, just very simple uh, questionnaires, like if they were fascinated by the activity or not, or uh, it, it can go uh, also to look into collaboration, if there is collaboration through the activity, or uh, into uh, knowledge with pre and post questionnaires. Thank you very much, Angelos. We also have a question for Brendan. Uh, we have, you've mentioned that you were using moral.co, and so some participants were asking if you have any other free alternatives or even how come you chose to use that that one specifically does it have extra features that maybe the zoom whiteboard doesn't have and additionally did you actually have technical help when you were using it that's great questions and um, i guess i experimented the first thing i did was looked for and i know it sounds a little naff but i, I looked up free online whiteboards and, and looked for those tools uh, and it was another EU partner uh, in Italy, uh, Rosario, who pointed out Mural, and I'd come across it being advertised. The thing that swung it for me, being very honest in the time that we're in, is that their 30-day trial was extended to 90 days, which already was very good, but also it has a lot of design thinking templates built in so that you can drag and drop those templates, which I found very, very useful to have. Uh, some of them were actually matching some of the thoughts that we're having independently about what tools we would use for the training. Uh, and yeah, a lot more functionality. Um, but in terms of free tools, uh, I can only say I experimented with one or two th things at the time, but I can't even remember just off the top of my head right now which ones they are, but it was simply a case of going free. Uh, but I would advise whatever website you end up with, check the pricing to make sure that free doesn't just mean a free trial, that it genuinely is a free tool for extended use. Sometimes they're advertised as free when, when they aren't. 
Thank you. That, that's very true. Now, we also have a question for Demetrius. Now, you were mentioning about your workshop. Was it, is it, was it purely transmissive when you were using Moodle, or can the participants interact and add their own ideas? Uh, well, um, I think um, that um, in general, a workshop is a model that uh, we mostly use in a, a asynchronous online learning. Uh, the interactions between participants depends on the way we will design the activity. I'm usually trying to include the collaborative assessments in order to increase interactions. And of course, we have the peer review phase where every participant interacts with each other. And uh, of course, it depends on the tools we will use. For example, in our Arduino course, uh, we have uh, simulators uh, uh, in uh, designing uh, circuits in Tinkercad. And so we asked for the, from the participants to give their own ideas in some assessments. And so it can be collaborative if you design it to be. Thank you very much. Now, we have a final question for Evo, though it could be for anybody, but if Evo has an idea, there are serious questions about personal data violations in a number of tools. Do you have any suggestion of how can we protect ourselves and protect our students? Uh, for my opinion, uh, this is uh, in a platform which we, we uh, use. Uh, as you know, uh, in Zoom have uh, before one two week uh, problem with personal data, but uh, there is a password, there is many, many tools how to protect uh, our data and especially in students, I think. This is an um, issue uh, for uh, platforms. You're absolutely right. Like Ivo was saying, that's something that we are responsible also for checking the different tools. And it's not only saying, yes, they're OK. You actually do need to read the pages, not only on price, as Bernard was saying, but it's also about how is the security there and how do they handle GDPR there. With this, I pass on the, the mic to Bjorn. Bjorn, it's all yours. Yes, so. Uh, at this point, it's time to wrap up and to close this webinar. Just some final words. Uh, this webinar is part of a new online series, the STEM Online Days. And I invite every one of you to have a look at the schedule. And I hope to see you in other online events that we're organizing over the course of the next weeks. I am also sharing with you now the link to the feedback survey. So here you should be able to click on the link on the slides and uh, to fill in the feedback survey right away. Uh, we would really appreciate your feedback and if you take about three minutes to share your thoughts so we know how to improve for the future. Also important, if you would like to receive a certificate of attendance, you have 24 hours from now on to fill in the survey and request the certificate at the end of the form. So for everyone watching the recording at a later point, please note that only participants who attended this webinar and who filled in the survey will be able to receive a certificate. The recording of this webinar together with the slides will be made available in the next days. And we will send every one of you a follow-up email with all the details. And now, my last uh, words before we close. A big thank you to Anna, Angelos, Brandon, Dimitrios, and Ivo for your really inspiring presentations. I also think this was a very interesting questions and answers session. So thank you, everyone, for participating. And this is it from my side. That's all. Take care. Stay safe in these times. Have a nice day. And bye-bye.